This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 12 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we'll be discussing them in further detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. Space Trek 3016, Episode 516, Scene 16, Take 16. Action! And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Ford. Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Og Hroth Dana Reknok, is what we're going with, for, which is Go Forth and Conquer Backwards. The release date was December 23rd of 2021. The in-episode dates were May 14th, followed by August 3rd of 10 years ago, August 1st of two years ago, October 1st of 10 years ago, February 28th of one year ago, November 5th of 10 years ago, June 20th, four years ago, and of course, May 16th, one year later. It'll make sense later, I promise. Uh, The writers... The writer was Brandon Vietti, the director was Christina Soda, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. That was absolutely the most complicated in episode takes we've had so far. That's amazing. Time travel. <laughs> Special guest voice credits. Uh, we have Tom Adcox as Clarion. Usman Ally as Khalid Nasur. Troy Baker as Jay Anson Schwartz and Johnny Drew. Erica Ishii as Mary Bromfield and Child. Kevin Michael Richardson as Naboo, Dechow, and Charlie Daggett. And still my favorite edition, D.B. Woodside as Phantom Stranger. This week's episode begins with yet another flashback. <laughs> this time about a younger Zatara working as a traveling stage magician. Well, one night when a fire broke out on stage, Zatara apparently used real magic to put it out, saving the unwitting audience. But unbeknownst to him, Kent Nelson happened to be in the audience as well and recognized him as a real magic user. And we'll get to that later. <laughs> After the credits, we cut back to the present where Child has banished Clarion from the mortal realm by killing Tikal and then blown up the Tower of Fate. Satana manages to protect herself and the others present inside from the explosion, but after a brief confrontation in the rubble, Child teleports away, leaving all of our magical kids to regroup. Over in Hollywood, Garfield's struggling on the set of Space Trek 3016, and somewhere else, Clarion is now a flaming diamond careening through time and space. We then abruptly cut to Metropolis 10 years ago, where we see a familiar bus driver welcoming some familiar kids to a very familiar bus. We then see the scene from the season one episode Schooled, where Superboy tries to help Superman save that bus from falling off a bridge. After both of them exit the scene, Diamond Clarion arrives, and having just missed the heroes he had been looking for, decides to anchor himself to the school bus and keep searching for someone to help him throughout all of time and space, and thus begins the adventures of the Young Justice magic school bus back in a different flashback we learn about zatara's past how following the fire incident he was compelled to do more with his powers and how after being inspired by the good work superman was doing in metropolis zatara decided to become a superhero as well after doing this for a while zatara met kent nelson who gave him guidance and direction in the world of magic and became a part of zatara's family However, during this time, Zatara's wife, Zendella, became sick with cancer and tragically passed while Zatara was on the road performing. Back in the present, Dr. Fate finally agrees. <laughs> Sorry, I laughed because of how ridiculous it was, what it took to get there. Dr. Fate finally agrees to go after Child alongside Zatanna's team, and the group travels to Australia, where a volcano has appeared in the middle of Sydney. When Nabuus insists that they can't stay to help those in danger, because defeating Child is far more important. 
Phantom Stranger appears to tell them that he's gathered every hero and magic user he can find to do damage control across the globe while they stop Child. In another series of flashbacks and flash forwards, we see the many adventures of the Magic School Bus, encompassing all of its previous appearances across the past three and a half seasons, as well as a couple of scenes set in the future, or unknown places, which we'll talk about later. (laughs) And back in the present, our team of magic heroes are rapid fire teleporting across the globe, trying to track down child, jumping from Sydney to Manhattan to Poseidonus to Taipei to Agra, arriving only moments after child leaves and seeing heroes and villains working together to contain the destruction she leaves in her wake. In our next flashback, we learn that after Zendela's death, Zatara chose to join the Justice League on Kent Nelson's recommendation and began taking Zatanna on the road with him for his fewer touring performances. We see Zatara's perspective on his decision to wear the Helmet of Fate to spare Zatanna and his belief that she must have felt abandoned despite his good intentions. Back in the present, Dr. Fate, Zatanna, and her Sentinels finally catch up to Child at the North Pole, but are unable to defeat her. After she leaves them to freeze to death, Clarion's magic school bus appears through a portal, Inside the Helmet of Fate, it's revealed that this episode's flashbacks have been Zatara telling Naboo his life story so that Naboo can one day pass those stories on to Satana after his death. And over the credits, we see a group of heroes go to Agra in time to save the people who were frozen by child. And we hear Superman propose that the League needs to set up an organized superhero reserve system to more effectively deal with large-scale threats like this one in the future. Let's do some Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Uh, there's some notes. How many storylines do we have going on in this one? So it may shock you that there are more timestamps in this one <laughs> than probably, I mean, than any other single episode and probably oh, mo- far. most of them combined. That's wild. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of timestamps. So I, can I go through these bus flashbacks real quick? Yes, because because this this like three and a half season lead up to a joke is one of the best things ever, in my opinion. Um, all right. So let's see. What do we do? We see the magic. We see the magic, the magic school bus. That's what we're going to call it. That's what uh, it is. Al- almost crash into bow hunter security on like the Pacific Coast Highway. Right. In season three. Yep. Get saved by it was Guy, right? Guy Gardner. Or Green Lantern and the plant, when they uh, giant plant fiasco. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, almost run over the Legion outside of Bibbo's diner, right? Which we don't see on screen in season three, but now we see in this. Oh, right. Yeah. It's clearly right after that meeting because of what like uh, Saturn Girl looks like and everything. But mm. uh, yeah, it's a scene we have not previously seen. That's fun. Getting saved by Rocket on the World Without Grown Ups episode, and then by Icon, which is funny, in the World Without Children back in season one. So they, so Rocket and Icon both save the bus at the same time it. in yep. the same place in the parallel worlds. We hadn't seen Icon do it until now, I uh, believe. That's so cool. like we only see Rocket. Like that's Rocket's first appearance, I think, in that episode. Yeah. So getting sa- Green Arrow and Black Canary show up. Wasn't that that wasn't the one with the plants? There's the one with the plants, and then there's yeah. the la- that we see that, and then Guy Gardner shows up as the final thing, and then there's a different scene in these flashbacks of Green Arrow and Black Canary saving this bus again at a different time. And Got I it. think that's during the Reach invasion. I think, but that's I can't right. be sure. Oh, then there's like- I did not go back and check. Yeah, so one of them is on a June. I mean, you pointed it out. It's on June twentieth. It's not. I don't think it's the right year, but that's the day that Wally died. Uh, oh, interesting. So I don't know. I don't know when that one is. Then, then flying through the uh, space time continuum, doing something, flying past Big Barda on Apocalypse, a year into the future. That's the future one. Mm-hmm. Yep. I didn't just see says that one year later. Stamp. That and well, the timestamp is the the most sixteen uh, one. There's a few in the other ones, but this one is on May sixteenth at sixteen sixteen. Nice. And so, okay, so we've seen Black Barda a couple times now. I mean, Big Barda a couple times now. I want to see her in a in the show, but now we know that it's at least one year later, past yep. the current episode. 
she's still on Apocalypse, and she hasn't left yep. yet. Okay. So, keeping that piece together. But there is the thing of, like, Claire, whatever whatever magic GPS Clarion is using on the magic school bus is specifically taking him to places with heroes. So whatever that means can be... It goes be... to Parda. Yep. Because mm-hmm. she, at some point... That's not crashing the mode. That's just speculation about what things mean. I think... No, I think, I think, I think you're right. Because, I mean, I mean, that just leads straight into Scott Free, Mr. Miracle, and Barda escaping. So, from Apocalypse. Which we, I want to see. Anyway, almost crashing into the baby bio ship, right? And then uh, going through last week's credit scene and almost crashing into Zatanna and the Magic Kids, the Sentinels when they were on the uh, merry-go-round <laughs> horses. Yep. I would like to, I, I don't know if I pointed this out. I don't think I did yet because it was crashing the mode. But of course, I didn't notice any of that until the joke. My son, I'm watching, I'm watching season one with Grayson. And he noticed the kids on the bridge. And then in the plants episode, he's, he paused it, went back and looked at it. And he's like, those are the same kids. It's the same bus in the very first season. <laughs> so he already, he already noticed this thing that I did not notice at all back in the time. So he's, they've only gotten through the first two seasons. So we're gonna, we'll do season three at some point later on. But I, I was want to give him a shout out for having actually noticed it was the same driver and the same kids. Speaking of shout outs, um, shout out to the YJ Wiki, uh, because I, there's no way I would have found this one this far along. There was an interview with the Dynamic Music Partners. Christopher Carter mentions like how difficult it was to create the score for this because you're basically popping back, forth, sideways, up, down, back, you know, literally backwards, forwards. You're going to scenes where like you had, potentially you had a musical score that already existed, but you're only dropping in for like a second or two. So, wow. So like weave together all of the episode callbacks of the school bus dimension traveling sequence, knitting disparate musical beats into a cohesive whole and also creating a new score that sounded like a callback for the scene where Black Canary and Green Arrow help the kids off the bus. That sequence was in the original script for season two, but ultimately not produced in the animation. Wow. So like there's a bus version where like it did. I'm trying to think through like is there a bus version where it stopped in season two and didn't go through three and four potentially which would have made me much sadder in comparison but yeah i in hindsight yeah try scoring jumping through yeah time and space like 20 times while doing the same with a second group <laughs> wow all right what do you got neil um, they're totally reading Noah's Ark at the beginning. I don't know that that's relevant, but it's very, to my eyes, seems very straightforward. Also, I have many questions about Kent Nelson and how long and if he was trying to find someone to potentially be the person to wear the helmet later. Like, is that his motivation for being at the show? You know, is that one of the motivations for going to Madame Xanadu the time to be like, ah, no, nah, you're fake. Is it? Is it, in essence, trying to find people with actual magical affinity to potentially wear the helmet or even just, or is that his like side gig in retirement? He's like, well, I guess I'll go find more, more magic people and tell you the Justice League. Yeah, that, no, he's fine. You should, you should let him join. I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, why in the world would otherwise would Kent Nelson need to go to Madame Xanadu about anything? Like he, that was clearly a test. You know, I agree with you. I like your theory. Yeah. And then the same thing. I mean, obviously, that's by far my favorite glow up of probably the series is Madame Xanadu going from like this trickster to literally orchestrating the entirety of the league and magic users to potentially find where child might be to go save things faster. Yeah, it was really cool. I just had this like flashback to uh, to Mal, right? when he was doing the same thing in season two, like after they graduated high school and it's five years later and now he's in there doing the organization. I love it. Um, I wrote down mother of goat. Um, Cause it, <laughs> again, it's just funny. Also, uh, like it was child at the end of last episode was child. Very scary based on what she chose to do. Yes. Is she absolutely terrified <laughs> by a casual flick of the wrist and blowing up the entire tower of fate? 
Because even on the rewatch, yeah. I, I don't know that in my head, I, I in my head, I had not been remembering that it was just a single, basically fu- ca- single cast of Fireball and the entire Tower of Fate was destroyed. And the petty version of like, hey, I can see some stuff that might have survived. I'm also blowing that stuff up too. You get nothing. And then dis- yep. disappear. Ooh. Rude. Awful. Um, but yeah, we, speaking of 16s, take 16, scene 16 yeah. of episode 516 of Space Trek 3016, which is actually like a direct callback from Leverage in season three, the opening there, which I, which I'm going to assume is actually the most on that one was the most on screen 16s because that time signature had three additional 16s. Uh, we got close, but I, it won't take the cake on that one. But now we know that apparently Space Trek has been going for five whole seasons. Beast Boy's been doing that for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And it kept going after like all the granny goodness stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they still got her. They're like, no, it's fine. That was her fault. No, 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 no. Don't worry. It's okay. Do we change the name? No, 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 no. It's fine. Don't worry about it. So then when Superman comes, like the Superman coming onto the news and being the inspiration for Zatara to pick up the mantle. That's cool. <laughs> so it says June 1. And then the timestamp is 1938. Action Comics number one is dated June 1938. So that's the the clear callback there. And I think I mentioned this in the Scream Somethings, maybe. I have, wait, say that again? The timestamp for what? So when he's at the news, like flying, and it's the first time that Zatara is seeing Superman being a hero... This timestamp on that newsreel is June 1st, 19 dot dot 48. So 748 p.m. And Action Comics number one came out June of 19. OK, I sorry for a second there. I thought you were saying that newsreel was from 1938. Oh, no. And I was like, wait a minute. Wait, what? OK, no. it was the time. I got you. I got you. I got you. Well done. Well played. Well, and the second one was for uh, it was November 28th at 1941, which is actually going to throw back. And I'm very disappointed. This is not a 16. It's a 17. Uh, the second animated short of 17 that Fleischer Studios had put on. Oh, Fleischer. Yeah, They're, those and were interesting. He, in that one, it's called the Mechanical Monsters. And that's what he does. And that's what the news article says. Defeats the Mechanical Monsters. So for me personally, and I had forgotten about this until this episode and then going back and watching those, these are those Fleischer ones are the first superhero content I ever saw as a kid. Like my grandma had like an old school VHS, which I mean, I say old school because it was old school at that time because it is hearkening back to something from the 40s. um, But it was the first animated superhero stuff that I saw were, were these Superman shorts. They're, you know what? The, they're so good. They're, they're really good. The animation is so fascinating. The sound is great. You know, there's a, there's a few stories in there that are just like, eh, this is clearly around World War II with uh, some interesting takes on yeah. <laughs> representation. But they're amazing. And they spent so much money on those animated pieces. Uh, they, I don't know if the story is apocryphal or not, but they were given a particular budget for the series and they thought that that was the budget they had for the run for like each individual episode. And so the first few episodes, they had spent a significant amount of money already. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why, like they really are a step above some of the animation from the time is they really spent the time on that, on those. And if you get a chance to see them, you should, you should watch them. And there's so many pop culture references to them. You know, um, they show up in a lot of different things. So, they're pretty cool. You should check them out. We have them on DVD. Oh, let's see if I can find my old VHS and get that. <laughs> I won't have anything to play it in, but I mean, I'll see. I was going to say, do you even have a VHS? Yeah, I mean, just hold it up to the light and slowly watch it one, <laughs> one frame at a time. Just... Load it up into a penny arcade yeah. and spin it around <laughs> like a flip book. Yeah. Okay. I have more. It should surprise no one the accuracy of Beast Boy's downtrodden statement of more like 140 million. 40 million. Which is, in fact, the average distance of Earth to Mars. Um, Certainly there are times when it is closer and times when it is further. But the mathematical average is, of course, 140 million miles. Okay. Magic people. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Did you know? The answer is no, I did not. So I'm going to see. Did you know? All three of the people that pop up behind Zatara 
before I either you read them right here or I say them out loud. Wotan's Wotan's your pro- so he's he's as he's saying like I get more into like the superhero game and then it pops behind him Wotan which more prevalent than the other two Black Briar Thorn yeah is the second one which he which only really shows up in misplaced Felix Faust is the third above him which again also really also only misplaced shows up. but Wotan's first appearance was issue number six of the tie-in comics here's a friendly reminder go read the tie-in comics. <laughs> Was that episode, was that, was his first appearance in the Titan comics that came before Misplaced? Yeah, because it was in Fears. And then what was the other one? Revelation? He was in that one too. Mm, yeah, he, he's been in a few. And he's, men- he's mentioned in the very first episode though. Yeah, Wotan definitely has the most present. It's still not a the ton. Most airplay. But yeah. No. He was going to blot out the sun. You know, the whole blotting out oh, the sun. Oh, that's mission. right. Just casually, just like, man, whatever. Wotan has gotten the amulets of Aten and is going to block out the sun. It's a small fire. <laughs> Not this, the Blot Out the Sun mission. Well, okay, since we're going to harken back to episode, season one, episode one, um, in that we get to see a animated version of Phil Barassa get frozen. Oh, right, in the park. <laughs> yes. Well, apparently, poor animated Phil Barassa, anytime he wants to go have a good time, it does not work out because he is at Agra outside the Taj Mahal. In theory, it does snow there, obviously. What? Yeah, in theory, it does snow in that area. Rarely, obviously not enough um, to freeze people, but he is one of the frozen people there. Um, at least that's the prevailing <laughs> theory because like, the, it looks identical <laughs> to that one. Um, also, oh, in the very no. end credit scenes the on the far left, I'm fairly confident that that's that same character. So he made it again. Apparently, you can't, you can't freeze animated Phil Barassa. He's surviving. Yeah. Or he's triplets. It's one or the other. It could be. Oh, I like it. Okay. We see Zatara, who has to be in one of Luther's grand hotels. Right. Because he is across the hall from 1616. <laughs> right. I saw that. And the wall decor, identical. Um, because I went through all of them. The options we have are uh, Metropolis, where Jeff and Jay stayed. We have Perdita in the Beverly Hills one, or Troya stayed in the uh, Buendasa one. Yeah. But in that episode, Luther states that there are many cities, many cities that he has the hotels in. So I'm not sure where he was to get such devastating news. But there was also our 16s there. I think that's all. I don't know. I think that's all I got. Other than... I wrote down a fate worse than death, and I can't tell if I love that line or hate that line. Really. <laughs> it's both. I, I was just like, it's, it's so good. I'm, <laughs> I don't know that I like it, though. It's, uh, it was really tough. Was, I think in the end, I love it. Um, but there was a half second where you're like, mm, how long were you waiting to do that? <laughs> Being an ancient champion of order does not prevent you from having bad superhero pun one liners. He was so he was so ready. He was so excited. OK, that's what I got for now. Well, I got some notes. I got some random notes. Let's do it. What do you got? Jumping around. Uh, I will just say you you can tell I'm a cat person because you can tell me Tickle's all you evil all you want. No, I still upset. I'm still upset. She's tiny and adorable, and she may be evil, but she is an adorable little cat, and I am upset. And we need to fight and beat child. <laughs> Tickle didn't deserve that. No, because because at the end of the day, would you say that that bus was evil? No. The bus only became evil <laughs> when it became an anchor. Stika was probably I mean, it, a completely normal everyday house cat until Clarion decided they weren't. And she's a good cat. And I will point out the rest of the team absolutely shocked that Child killed Tikal, which means the rest of the team has seemingly, at least the rest of the Sentinels, have never actually fully considered that as an option, which, you know. We all kind of agree that this cat, that's a bridge too far, yeah. man. That's the that's the nuclear option. I love the line. Now I'm just a flaming diamond careening through time and space because uh, it's just such a good encapsulation of the chaos that is uh, this Clarion storyline. Uh, I also in that first bus flashback, I do love the detail of Charlie, the bus driver, noticing Superboy and processing that that's weird because that's a very good point in yeah. school that, that like. Superboy showed up on the middle of a crowded bridge, and apparently that never made the news <laughs> until <laughs> until season three. But Charlie the bus driver knew. Charlie the bus driver knew something weird was going on here. I have a question that I caught just recently. 
and neither of you brought it up in notes so far. Maybe you bring it up later. I didn't read through all your notes. Clarion looks at Charlie and says, you look familiar. You sound familiar. He's he's referencing Tico because Tico always corrects him. So he's he starts to go in. And he's like, oh, I'm going to go into this motorcycle. He's all, I'm sorry, I took over your skateboard. He's all, it's a bus. He's like, oh, you sound like somebody I know. Oh, really? I thought he said you look familiar. Oh, interesting. Okay. Because I'm like, is there something there? Like, what is that? What is that going on? I couldn't catch it. Oh, I mean, that one's tough because the timey-wimeyness of it. Who's to say this is the, even the even the first time he's seen Charlie? Oh, yeah. You're not wrong, though. Yeah. Nobody knows. Interesting. I don't okay. know. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your, your no, run you're of aster there, Emily. No, you're all good. Um, other little details. Uh, in the Zatara flashbacks, uh, Zatanna's like toddler costume is the same color scheme as what she is initially wearing in uh, season one in her civilian outfit that's like a purple tank and white pants is just mirrored in what they put her in as a toddler, which is a nice fun detail. I also think it's cute that the levitate spell that Zatara uses to make Zatanna fly in flashbacks is the same spell that she uses all the time, which would make sense if she's been hearing it her entire life. I love the idea that that's one of the first things Zatanna learned and that that's just chaos in that household. <laughs> It just feel it feels like the most frequently used because even getting the rubble off and then standing yeah. and standing people up, it just constantly yeah, that's probably the easiest one. It is a very good writing consistency detail that Zatanna has go to spells, and if you watch enough of the show and pay attention, there are ones that she uses over and over again for specific things that Zatanna has apparently decided are like her her go to's for stuff she has to do all the time. And I love that. The only one I would point out that I think was new here was, oh, I like the card tricks and stuff from Zatara, but from Zatanna was right before it blows up, uh, was backwards make us incorporeal. So then they survive the explosion. Saying incorporeal backwards is, I, I'm still so impressed by these actors. I don't do it that well forward. It sound like. I don't. <laughs> it's a specific talent of Lacey Chabert and we, Give her all of the credit in the world. Oh, yeah. All the credit. <laughs> we keep trying to say these titles and they're difficult. <laughs> I will throw out in all this that I know we talked about it last week of saying Zatara is definitely Catholic because he's Italian, but also Zatara is definitely Catholic because the church that we show him in here has a crucifix instead of a cross. And for people who didn't go to 13 years of Catholic school, the crucifix yeah. is a, a cross is plain a crucifix is one that also depicts jesus on it and is used in a handful of different christian denominations but is very prominent in catholic symbolism most other forms of christianity tend to just have the plain cross though i i just the the personal joke that i have this time through is as someone who grew up going to catholic school and had to go to mass apparently zatara goes to the most bare bones catholic church to ever exist and I get that it is just a uh, two second shot for a flashback, but it made me laugh when I had to pause the episode at one point and be like, that's just some curtains. Uh. You know what it made me think of? I don't think this is the case. Let's preface. But it did make me think of a lot of the scenes that you see in shows where they go to the uh, chapel inside of a hospital. Oh. Like the space, like because it was like you said, it was so sparse, it was so small that like could thirty people have been there at the same time? I don't know, but it just makes me think of that classic. You know, someone is there, and the second character walks in um, to talk to them. But yeah, now that yeah, now that you mention it, because he lives in a big city, he's like in a sky, like like a multi storied building. But then, yep, you can actually kind of, and this might just be me being slightly crazy uh but if in one of the shots of zatara's apartment you can see like a cathedral window through his window like there is a shape that i'm like that's a gothic cathedral yeah. stained glass window in the distance so i took that as the implication that they live near like a metropolitan catholic church which are big and very Ooh. detailed yeah um and and therefore that's the only this isn't a real criticism i have no problem with this being how they decided to do this 
Catholic churches are very big and very detailed. I am not expecting anybody to hand draw and animate that. But I will still laugh to myself at being like, that's just some curtains. <laughs> but uh, other things for this episode, um, shout out to Zatanna being ready to fight Naboo at any given moment for any reason. Uh, like he finally is like, yes, we should fight child. She's like, oh, you think? <laughs> and I love her oh, for that. Oh, now that we almost um, died and we oh, now you're, lived? Now you're ready to go. We lived because she didn't care enough to kill us? And now you're ready to do something? <laughs> cool. Great. I love, I we say it all the time, but I do love that Zatanna, despite being like a, a 24-year-old magic teenage, magical girl, is like, I will fight the most ancient magical force on this planet because he's mean and he took my dad yeah. and I'll punch him in the face. <laughs> like, like that's Zatanna's baseline attitude. On a, on a more technical note, I love the sound design detail that... After the Helmet of Fate gets cracked, instead of Zatara and Nabu's voices being like perfectly layered in the sound design, you can actually, if you're listening for it, it wavers back and forth between whose voice is the stronger, louder of the two. And it only does that after the helmet gets cracked, which is a cool audio way of showing what's up there. I love in that scene also that like it's not the simple magic, you know, she drops the get camera ready again for them all to look presentable and not disheveled. I was trying to see if I had it in my notes where, yeah, I'm not sure which one he uses to fix himself, but like instantly noting, oh, yeah, that didn't fix the helmet. We we prob- we have a bigger problem. Yeah. 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 That thing's not supposed to get damaged. And now I have a weird deep dive. Because Neil has Ooh, big deep up. dives into comic book history, and I did a thing <laughs> this time for something different. So we have a scene where Madame Xanadu is apparently coordinating all of the heroes around the entire world, and Phantom Stranger says that they're sending out heroes as fast as Madame Xanadu can predict what the next crisis is going to be. Yeah. And they illustrate this by having her uh, using tarot cards. And so I... <laughs> <laughs> went through and did research into what all of the tarot cards that you can because even though they are pretty simple a lot of them are very clear what they're actually supposed to be so fun informational facts from emily most of madame xanadu's tarot cards are based off of the very famous uh rider weight deck which if you've seen a tarot deck on television that's probably the one you've seen it's generally the most well-known art to be on tarot cards but some of the ones that are floating around her above her are not they're just different designs that aren't based off of those the death card that depicts a grim reaper with a scythe is more in line with a much earlier deck called uh the tarot de marseille it's french that's how i'm gonna say it but i don't know if it's completely right the card showing a hand holding a circle is probably supposed to be the world, uh, the world card, um, but it isn't based off of either of those decks. It's, but it is kind of in line with like more common general modern tarot design. So that's my assumption there. But I have no idea what the one that looks like it's a star over a bell is supposed to be. I've spent too long trying to Google that and have not come up with an answer. But the reason I lay all of that out is I actually went through and looked up the meanings for all of these tarot cards that you can nice. put together on her spread that she has made. Looked them up either mostly in my little tarot workbook that I own. And then for one that didn't make any sense, I Googled it a little more and found a different uh, reading for it that makes more sense because this tarot spread is actually kind of in line thematically with the episode. And that makes me happy because a lot of the time on TV, they're not. Uh, <laughs> so here is the breakdown. If you go clockwise, because I'm going to try to describe this so that anyone who looks at a screenshot can actually, um, if you look going clockwise around the like square that she has set up, starting at the top, the card that is in between two black cards with blue stars on them, starting point for where I'm about to describe this. If you start there and go clockwise, you have the two of pentacles, which is uh, which means decisions and balance, the fool which is beginnings and risks. Uh, what I think might be 
the Page of Swords. That one's a little harder to tell, but that is the closest image I can find for it, uh, which either deals with gossips and contracts or new ideas and communication. The Three of Swords, which is heartbreak and grief. The Star, which is hope and guidance. The Eight of Pentacles, which this was the one that I looked up later and found this meaning for it. Apprenticeship and mastery. Mm. And then you have the Two of Cups in the center, which is partnerships and relationships. From left to right, floating above her are a card I can't identify that has a bell and a star on it that probably means something. The world, which is success and completion. The sun, which is growth and recovery. And death, which stands for transformation, change, and new beginnings. So basically, that general spread means change is coming. People need to communicate with each other. Uh, people need to help and guide each other, and that's the only way anything is going to succeed. And I find that interesting because it actually does kind of mean something here. That is amazing. I don't know why I didn't even think to take a look. Of course, it's going to have exactly what it's supposed to have. I hadn't thought to do that until this watch through when I was taking notes, and I was like, wait, are those real cards? Because because I have watched shows even recently. I watched Buffy last year, and there's a character who uses tarot cards a lot. And at one point, they have her doing a full spread, and I like paused it and looked at it. And not only were half of the cards not cards, <laughs> like Whoa. not only did a lot of them not mean anything, a lot of them just weren't even <laughs> tarot cards. Like they were just different drawings for fun. But this one is weirdly in line, especially knowing where this arc goes without spoilers. This spread of cards is weirdly in line and i hope whoever animated this was thinking things through because it seems like they were because they didn't even just do like iconic major arcana they were going into like yeah. here's the eight of pentacles and here's the three of swords and i'm like somebody somebody knew what they were storyboarding yeah you thought this through and i want to give you your kudos whoever you are who drew this nice okay anybody else have notes <laughs> So I don't sound ridiculous. Um, no, no, you're good. Anything else? What do you she got? I think my last two things here that are much smaller things. I do think it's interesting to note again um, in this whole arc. We've been talking about how like Zatanna is in charge of these kids and it keeps getting kind of reference that Zatanna isn't necessarily the most patient of mentors in some ways like her first scene is her like the first thing she gives everybody is like criticism and then follows it up with like but you're fine um and all of that and how we've just discussed that and i noticed this time through when they show up at um the north pole and they're like oh no this is going to be really difficult she just straight up says cut it out and follow the plan like she's like there is no time for this and i find it interesting I because I don't think Zatanna is a bad mentor or a bad leader, no. but I do think it is interesting that they have made this kind of consistent thing of her being like, I am not coddling these kids and how that for some people kind of comes off as the idea that she is much rougher around the edges than some of the mentors we have seen in the past. And I just find it interesting how it's been this consistent thing through the arc. Possibly. Yeah. I don't know. I, I see her doing that and I'm like, okay. It feels like coaching. It just feels like coaching yeah. to me. Like there's, there's, let's talk this thing through. And then there's, we're spending so much time thinking about the problem of what the problems could be, or we could just take that time and solve the problem, yeah. you know, or move through the problem. So there's this balance of coaching of just like, you can do more than you think you can stop thinking about it and do right. There is no, there is no try. There's only do kind of coaching. Yeah. The other thing is, you have to think about how we were introduced to her character in the show. Like the whole thing was like, no, you don't even get to hang out with these kids. Nonetheless, become basically part of this team that is going to go do what I'm already doing. Um, because they, but all of that in some way gets explained here too. Of like, well, I don't want you to go do that because if you do that, then are you, you know, do the people you love feel like you're stepping away from them? Even the, yeah. and so all of these things. Also, there's no time. There's no time at all. There yeah. are volcanoes about to yeah. blow up the opera in Sydney. And Phil Bross is being frozen left and right. Again, poor guy. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I just think it's very interesting, especially because as you pointed out, it's the thing of like, I think we, we talked about this early in this arc, but the idea that Zatanna did not have any sort of like 
formal mentorship and training, like that her dad often didn't really want to teach her magic and didn't want her to follow this path. So she has been at least partially self-taught for most of her life and now is in charge of three different teenagers with magic who all have powers entirely different from hers that she is just expected to be the person in charge of these kids. And so it is just a very interesting dynamic to see, especially on rewatches of being like, huh. Yeah. It's just interesting. I think she's doing a great job, all things considered. Agreed. Agreed. My last note, final note before we move on to crashing the mode and everything else. Um, I just thought it was interesting this time through noticing the uh, parallel of how a few episodes back when Vandal Savage was doing all his flashbacks, Nabu responded by being like, why do you tell us what we already know? But when listening to uh, Zatara tell his life story, Fate says, why do you tell us what we do not need to know? And I, again, (laughs) want to fight Dr. Fate. (laughs) Me and Zatanna both want to fight Dr. Fate. He's got no respect. It's a good parallel and a mean thing to say. (laughs) Stick around. Class is in session. There's a lot we can talk about in this episode and this whole arc about character development and flashbacks, etc. But the thing that sticks out for me about this episode is, of course, the bus. This joke starts in episode five of season one and didn't get resolved or even recognized by most of us until now. Not only does that require an immense amount of planning, it requires a knowledge of your source material. How many times have you read a comic or watched a TV series or movie or whatever and thought, wow, they need handrails on every building the number of times Lois Lane falls off a roof? Or why are bridges so badly made? Or need to raise the jeopardy? Busload of kids in danger. YJ managed to take this multiple cliches, actually, and answer the question, why is it always a busload of kids? Uh, Turning the cliche into a fascinating plot point and also a Twilight Zone ending to the joke, you can do this with your own genre of choice, whatever it happens to be. Whatever your favorite thing is, you're always asking yourself questions like this. Take the things that people expect in that genre and find a way to explain it in your world. Why do dragons hoard gold? Does a secret agent or an assassin always need to be a traumatized orphan? (laughs) Why do architects in Star Wars hate handrails? (laughs) If you can find a way to rework or explain the cliche in a memorable way, your readers or watchers will talk about it for years. And as a little bonus debrief for those of you who might not know what a Twilight Zone ending is, it's when the story ends and some reveal makes you realize that you've been experiencing the story based on your own preconceptions and assumptions. And watching it again makes it a whole new story. It's hard to rewatch earlier seasons of YJ now without looking for that bus in every scene. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. All right, well, let's, let's jump into Crash in the Mode then. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in Season 4. In Crash in the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Beast Boy's a mess. Credit where it's due, though. I mean, not that it was the best landing at the end of the like overall statement, but it's literally like, here is another entity in which you are connected to that could then provide you potentially with something to help you. And I am offering, I mean, obviously there's a lot of ulterior motives on his part um, to be like, yeah, Yeah. it's the best for the show. I mean, you too, which is like obviously not sticking the landing. And is that ultimately why he (laughs) says no, but here's another opportunity to say uh, maybe you could get help via these avenues. Yeah. Agreed. And it is, and I appreciate that it is an adult actually offering like a specific form of help. Yeah, like yeah. Blue Devil, s- several se- episodes earlier was just kind of like you doing okay, and this guy at least straight up goes, "Hi, we have we have counselors, we have someone you can talk to." And Beast Boy still says and no. You like should talk to, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, Mary, not quite a mess yet. You know, I I look at what she did. And I follow all of her thought processes. As a matter of fact, they talked about it afterwards and said, hey, 
that wasn't cool. She explained herself. They said, okay, I kind of, yes, I kind of understand that, but it was really uncomfortable. And please don't do that again without asking. And her response is, okay. Like she, she nods and she agrees in my reading of it that she won't, she knows, she said, I'm really sorry. I know that that wasn't okay. Like, cool. But like we were going to die and I was the only one conscious. So I did what I thought I had to do at the time. Now it doesn't turn out great later, but like in this one moment and in a, in a vacuum, I kind of understand where she's coming from. Genuine question. Cause I don't remember. Please feel free to remind me. Does she actually apologize? She does say she does say I'm sorry at some point okay. in that in that scene. I can go back and look at it again, but I'm pretty sure because I watched it, I was like, oh, she actually said sorry. It okay. may have been a little <laughs> a little bit of an I'm sorry, but I was the only one on con- I was the only yep. one conscious, and they just yeah. blew up the Tower of Fate. So uh, I didn't I'm not going to just I didn't have time to ask. I didn't have time to ask, and you weren't conscious. And I draw power from ley lines, and the Tower of Fate uh, ostensibly probably lives on ley lines, and it got wrecked. So. Well, on that note, I, so there's uh, there's another scene that, like, I think is just further illustrating that. So when they're there in Sydney, and she just has that moment where she's, like, reaching out towards the volcano, I can't figure out if I feel like it's because that lay, like, that ley line is now broken or if that ley line is now open. Like, oh, is, yeah. she, is she like, ooh, yeah. ooh, shiny? <laughs> or is it like, shiny. oh, no. Um <laughs> Uh, wow, I could, yeah. I could. Snack I would on lean that towards Ushiny um, because that kind of fits the narrative. I mean, but yeah. even, but even speaking to that, like you are given in the same episode, you are given ex- an example of sharing power in a way that everyone agrees upon. The th- the, yeah, yeah. The three Sentinels give it to Zatara, or not to? Well, yeah, to Zatara via Zatanna, uh, and it's like, well, this is what we could have been doing, but like, I mean, there has to be some resistance. You're just going to try and take it from me. I'm intuitively going to say no thank you like and so yeah but if you were all working together then i assume it would work a lot better like well like it kind of worked but yeah and it's to me the thing that it's making me think of now is a little bit of like this has never been discussed among them like di- like i the thing that i thought of when watching it is how back in season one there's the whole thing about how robin can't be team leader because not communicating with your teammates and just assuming they know what you're going to do is a big problem and shows that you're not ready for responsibility. Why didn't you guys follow me and disappear into the woods? Yes. (laughs) Uh, And then as we're talking about this now, I'm thinking about the way that like McGann using telepathy in season one is initially portrayed Mm. as like, this is a violation of privacy and whatnot. But by the end of season one, once everybody is communicated, like this is how we work. Everyone is fine that like the second we step into a mission, McGann hooks everybody's minds up and we know that this is what we do and that's fine, which to all of which keeping all of that in mind communicates to me that like these guys don't have a set plan in place for something like this of like if there is an emergency, is it ever okay for Mary to just take everybody's power kind of thing? It feels like they like they're she's training them individually. Yeah. But is she training them to be a team? And I'm unconvinced. I'm unconvinced that she's training them to be a team, but she is training them individually. Like, this is how you use your powers. This is how you use your powers. This is how you use your powers. Right. Yeah. I would. I mean, even, even the verbiage, like, you know, we're, we're calling them the Sentinels, but like, I don't know that it's really tacked on, or at least not until now, where it's always been referred to as my protégés, my protégés. I mean, I would say the same thing if, like, I mean, I don't really have anything that I'm trying to teach anybody, but in the same way that, like, if I'm going to show a bunch of people how to be a dungeon master for D&D, I'm probably not going to have them all working with me at the same time. Like, they could all be my protégés, but not with the intent of all of them working together, especially with the three of these being so different. So, yeah. (laughs) They don't have plans. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, yeah. The more I think about it, the more I think that she has them, she's training them individually, but is she training them to have be like another, you know, capital T the team? Right. I don't think that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even going back to the first episode in this arc, like when they are fighting the little gremlins whose name escapes me, like, I feel like they don't like work in concert together necessarily to do that. They're all just kind of doing their own little bits. They work very separately. Yeah. Yeah. 
which is interesting observations. <laughs> um, but is all of which we're here to just be like, Mary's just making choices, and and I think that's part of what's interesting about this ultimate downfall of Mary, quote unquote, is like mo- so much of what she's doing makes sense. It's just not being handled right because like the eventual thing that happens yeah. is like next episode we're going to see when Zatanna says you're not ready to be Dr. Fate and if Mary had been like yeah I hear you I get it and just walked away and we'd all had like some communication there that she'd be at a very different place than her getting very upset and storming off and accidentally becoming a supervillain. Oops. It's a lot of it to me is not that necessarily that what Mary does is inherently wrong. It's the way that she reacts when called out about it that Mm -hmm. ends up being what pushes her towards not doing the right things. Yeah. And I think there's, I mean, that feeds into some of this, you know, this addiction parallel again. Right. Yeah. Because it's like, okay, you said I couldn't have power. I agreed. I'm not having that power. And now I'm training the way you asked me to train and I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. And everyone else is being rewarded with power and you are continuing to tell me that I do not, I'm not allowed to have it and that there's something fundamentally wrong with me as an individual, like me as a person. And um, that's where that addiction to power starts to kind of creep in and take hold, right? Or that addiction to anything, whether it's, you know, alcohol or pain meds or smoking or whatever. Like there's always that little part inside of you, that voice that's trying to, talk you into or convince you or want you to go do the thing, right? Giving you that rationale to go do the thing. And, you know, and she's like, okay, well, I can't have power this other way. So I'm, 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 I want to be a hero and I'm trying to do the best and I'm still not allowed to have it. And granny goodness is just giving her, giving her what she wants. That's all. She's just trying to help later. Oh my gosh. The ends justify the means. It's the approach. I mean, it's your classic superhero discrepancy between multiple ones saying, well, we can't do this because of that, or, you know, or this, you know, we need to sacrifice this to gain that. Like that is, you know, really, if if used correctly, ends up with some of the best narratives you can have because you have two people who in your eyes as the viewer are both heroes, but they're at odds because one says, no, this is fine. And the other says, no, that's absolutely not what we're going to do. And potentially, you know, in this case, Inevitably, someone says, that is fine. You should come over here. We do that all the time. Don't worry about it. Ley lines. We got a whole planet full of ley lines. Ah, come over. Shazam. Um, <laughs> and now you have a terrifying <laughs> villain. Mm-hmm. Yep. Along with Kara. Oh, my gosh. It's just crash in the play. mode. Supergirl Super- shows up for 10 Super- seconds. Hey, by the way, <laughs> yeah. Season. Yeah, because what you want to be partnering up with uh, with uh, Sergeant Marvel is uh, Supergirl, because that's a thing. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that's horrifying. Anyway, all right, I think we're all on the same page here. Mary could be handled a little differently, but was not, and she could have reacted a little differently, but she didn't. It's a very delicate balance. And yeah, for me, I think it's a pretty interesting thing that is it. Zatanna wasn't training them to be a team. Therefore, they weren't a team. Therefore, they don't have answers to these questions you're talking about, Emily, which I think is really critical. Hey, hey by the way, did you know that um, Superboy's not dead? Super not did dead. you wonder what those rocks floating in uh, space it was were the only It was the only inconsistency I was about to call out. Claire, you're on your own. There's at least one hero there. It's Superboy. Because you're in the Phantom. What did he, did he say? Phantom Girl's he, also he, there, but she's in a coma. Oh, that's yeah. True. He was uh, like, "Oh, there's no heroes here." I mean, granted, it's the Phantom Zone. He certainly could have been where there are no heroes nearby. But yeah, no, but he, but he is, he is because Zatanna's going to touch the bus later and see that the bus and see, saw Superboy. Oh yeah, yeah. The um, Superboy was nearby. Yeah, yeah. So Clarion just wasn't paying attention. Really? Do you think he was squirreled out on that one? Do you feel like it would have a deeper connection because the bus, while taken over by Clarion? Or the bus has already been near <laughs> Superboy before. Nice. Whoa. I like this. There you nice. Go. Oh, yeah, don't we talk about tinfoil hats at the, the opening of this? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, okay. totally. um, uh, wild flights of How fancy, deep does this theory go? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. 
little psych- psychometric link. I heard that Greg and Brandon were on buses as children. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And with all that, I think we can say it out of the watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as we have to look a little bit harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember... Stay Stay whelmed, everyone. Stay whelmed, everyone. Boom. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.